Gentlemen, we have called you together to inform you that we are going to overthrow the United States government. You still think that jet fuel brought down the World Trade Center? Does anybody else see a problem here? If the government has nothing to hide, why are they so afraid to answer a few questions? This story does not add up. My name is Foster Gamble, and I have spent nearly a lifetime trying to figure out what happened that could account for the staggering agony and deprivation on this planet. I set out on a journey seeking to answer questions like, is it even possible for humans to thrive? I found a code, a pattern in nature that's been embedded in arts and icons throughout the centuries. Yes, there have been crashed craft and bodies recovered. But who do you tell that you were involved in a uh, UFO incident without them looking at you like you, you ain't wrapped too tight? It's not etched into the rock. It's not carved. It's burned into the atomic structure in some extraordinary way. I believe that they're giving us a model for accessing energy in a clean, safe, limitless way that could completely revolutionize the way all people live. Right here in this toroid, we have enough energy to transform the entire Earth. And that's not just a theoretical statement, it's literally true. The energy is extracted from the fabric of the space around us, which means it cannot be metered. That is a direct threat to the single largest industry in the world, energy. The suppression of UFO phenomena is hand in hand with the suppression of so-called free energy. An elite group of people and the corporations they run have gained control over not just our energy, food supply, education, and health care but over virtually every aspect of our lives. The way the system of medicine is set up, medical education is funded by pharmaceutical companies. We have a privately owned central bank system disguised as a government owned system. There is no other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. It gives them the ability to print money in a way that the insiders are protected and everybody else is trained. No matter where you go in the world, he who controls the money controls the world. The time has come to say, enough. There is another way. If you want alternative energy, you don't ask an oil economy to produce it for you. We have to produce it. The power of the Internet enables us to share the depth of this research. There is an extraordinary, fierce group of people who are taking this on. We can make a real difference right now. The simple power of truth. We're not nearly as insignificant in our impact as we think we are. There is a force that's more powerful, and that's the power of the people. We can create a world where people can thrive. Thrive. What on earth will it take? Be a part of the conversation. Be a part of the solution. We're joined now by the two filmmakers of Thrive, which really takes, takes a deep look at what we could do for alternative systems of energy and an altogether reformed system itself, as there's so many problems here on Earth, there's so many potentials, but how do we tap into that and how do we defeat the system that is currently occupying our world and preventing us from reaching that further development. We are joined now by Foster Gamble and his wife, Kimberly Carter Gamble, both who put together the film Thrive. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having us on. 
So, uh, yeah, certainly appreciate you joining us. There's a whole history of hidden occult technology, uh, suppressed free energy going back to Tesla and John Worrell Keeley and so many other inventors, uh, probably mostly 100 years ago and even more. And here we are today uh, with our problems just growing and growing, and it seems we're unable to tap into that. We know it has to do with the entrenched interest and the way uh, things have grown up around that issue. So let's kind of lay out the groundwork and then start to uh, talk about what could be done about it. Great. Well, you mean in, in relation to free energy, the, the key to that area of solutioning, as well as so many others for us as we lay out in the movie, is an understanding of this toroidal form, this donut-shaped vortex, which is apparently the fundamental shape uh, that sustainable systems must acquire uh, in order to last in a healthy way throughout our universe, you know, from atoms to the clustering of galaxies. So one application of that understanding of kind of the blueprint of uh, enduring healthy systems is uh, that there are numerous inventors, have been for over a century and maybe way back even to ancient cultures, or, um, who mimic this pattern with various types of materials and then put their technologies into resonance, either rotating at a certain uh, uh, frequency or vibrating at a certain frequency, uh, getting into a certain harmonization of a sequence of magnets and so forth in such a way that the natural toroidal shape of how energy flows and dances in our universe is mimicked by a device. And then the device, when tuned properly, can actually start pouring out electricity cleanly and, and safely. So this has been done by numerous inventors. We've been able to be into some of those labs and see them firsthand. And it just moves you to tears when you realize we don't need to be fighting over other people's oil. We don't need to be uh, creating asthma and destroying the, our atmosphere and so forth. These technologies already exist. However, they are virtually all being brutally suppressed. These laboratories are being uh, raided by SWAT teams. The equipment is being stolen. The, uh, the uh, patents are being suppressed and so forth. So we're in a political d dilemma, kind of where the the electric car was, you know, 40 years ago, where and now we're seeing the electric cars are finally starting to come out, even though we had them, you know, decades ago. I have no question that we have access to these so-called zero point or radiant, these new energy technologies. Now we've just got to get enough uh, uh, social will, enough uh, financial support behind these inventors to secure their labs and to get these technologies completed and out there so that people have access to them and we can drastically reduce our, uh, our electric and, and fuel bills and also have proof that we're living actually in a universe of infinite abundance. We've been told progress is about greater centralization of government, but actually this film shows and all the research I've done shows that getting independent, getting decentralized, going back to the local and the idea of having that technology at a personal and community level is really what would give us uh, what I would consider anyway true progress. Uh, your responses you want to, to that. talk about that at all? Yeah, well, I think that that, you know, one of the things that we've done is we really embedded Thrive within a context of solutions because um, I think that when people realize that there is so much that they can do on a local level and in their personal lives, it actually allows them to be more open to the information. I know for me, the way this started was that um, I used to work with abused and homeless kids. And when I did that, I subscribed to various magazines and periodicals all about the state of children in the world. And I could just devour those magazines and then go to work because I felt like there was some impact that I could have on the situation. And as soon as I wasn't doing that work anymore, the periodicals and magazines were still coming, and I couldn't even look at them. I just couldn't take it in. And it really showed me how people need to feel that they can have an impact on a problem to even be able to take in the information about how bad it is. And so what we're finding, like but with Thrive and with the work that you do and others, that as people are getting informed, they're also realizing that there's so many solutions. And we've developed this whole solutioning model. And a lot of it has to do with local communities organizing around issues that, that are relevant to them right there. Certainly it has, that has to do with energy as well. Right. And we see other problems, too, like 
uh, impoverished parts of Africa or Latin America where people uh, come with true charitable intentions, bring technology, but through the divide and conquer model, you've got competing gangs and, and globalist entities who encourage the wiping out of those villages, suppressing even those kind of solutions. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, Aaron, when you were talking about that decentralization, one of the women who's in our film, uh, an evolutionary biologist, Elizabeth Saturis, she, uh, she says, I think, very cleverly that when you go out into the forest, good luck finding the boss. You know, it's a self-creating mm -hmm. uh, symbiotic system. And I think that to, the, to whatever degree we even centralize resistance to the centralized system, we're more vulnerable. But what we're thrilled to see happening, and I know that you're seeing this uh, with your vast network as well, that people are creating uh, independent, self-generating, thrive solutions groups in cities, in counties, in states, and in countries all over the world, uh, inspired by the, the information that they're getting from sources like yours and ours, but then also moving on to use a solutions model that is based on how nature works. This same torus that, that I was referring to, it has kind of a twin. And for the scientists in the group, it's called the vector equilibrium. And that's kind of the, the how nature structures the material world. So we've come up with a solutions model. I think you have a picture of it, if you can bring it up on your, your screen. The, first of all, in, in three dimensions, it's called the sector navigator. And we show it in the movie, in, uh, in computer graphics. And th there are 12 spheres, what we call representing the sectors of human endeavor. And it's justice and economics and science and media and, and spirituality and so forth. It really co seems to cover all of human endeavor. And in our solutions approach, we invite people in their communities to come together who are inspired to turn things around, then self-identify as to which sector they're drawn to. What, what are they passionate about? What are they good at? And then to, to meet in subgroups with people who are in that sector. And then further to identify, okay, am I someone who wants to work on uh, immediate needs? Am I a doctor who want to go, wants to go to Africa and work with Doctors Without Borders or you know, serve food in a soup kitchen or something like that? Or am I someone who would rather work on the systemic level, working on, ha uh, on the corruption in the economic system or in the media system or in the governance system and so forth? Or am I someone at the third level who uh, feels talented with helping people expand their worldview, to deepen their knowledge, what we call the consciousness shift? And what we've been finding is that as people find their particular niche, and realize that all of the other sectors and the other levels are also going to be being handled by highly skilled and passionate people, there's a sense of profound relaxation where one can go about doing your part in communication with sectors that are doing all of the other parts, but knowing that nobody has to do the whole thing. So this is something that we're really excited about and uh, seeing just inspire people and help people to organize uh, all over the country and all over the world. Right. Yeah, and, you, sorry, go ahead. I, I just wanted to say we used that model effectively um, when we were being sprayed with the uh, light brown apple moth aerial spray assault that happened over Northern California. And um, the Monterey, Santa Cruz, and Marin counties um, organized using this model and um, within six months, a program that was fundamentally funded through Homeland Security, had hundreds of millions of dollars behind it, was shut down in six months. And, and I know through the Freedom of Information Act, when we saw some of the inside correspondence, we saw one email that said that they had anticipated resistance, but they didn't know it would be so well organized. And I, I think that it really had to do with the fact that you know, people need to know there's something that they can do about it, but not only that, but that they can do what they're good at and are naturally drawn to instead of that each person is supposed to have to take on the whole thing, which, you know, you burn out and you can't do. So I think that uh, having seen it and experienced it ourselves and now watching other communities get into it, 
I'm excited because I feel like more and more people are waking up to what is going on and are ready to engage in these meaningful and localized solutions. Well, I totally agree because it's not a question of what we're capable of. It's a question of what aren't we capable of. The system yeah. knows that. You've got exactly. uh, John D. Rockefeller saying competition is a sin, and you've got this whole 